Once. All right, welcome back. This is the Yemen Roundtable. And I'm glad you all have your meals. Like I said, it's, it's like a drive-in theater. Um, how many of you know that this law school has an NPR radio show called Talking Foreign Policy? All right, that's good. Now, some of you don't know that. Um, and I invite you to listen to it. It's um, archived, and you can listen to it anytime. And whenever we come out with one, and our next one is going to be about the Rohingya situation, it's on October 1st at 10 p.m. You can hear it live on Cleveland's NPR station, 90.3 FM. You can hear it worldwide on their webcast. Now, the reason I raise that is because we are going to replicate the talking foreign policy experience. Um, almost everybody here has been on the show before, and in fact, we did a show on this topic in which uh, Paul and Malena and Jim and Laura were on. And so you'll get to see what you know this whole talking foreign policy thing is all about. Uh, I think you're going to like it. All right. So always starts out with a teaser, with with um, the moderator, you know, starting kicking things off. So here we go. Oh, and, and you'll, you'll notice that my voice turns into this, like, Mr. Radio voice. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a quick funny story. When we first piloted this, um, we did one on piracy. And afterwards, I asked the studio, well, how did it go? Are you going to pick us up? And they're like, mm, not so much. <laughs> and I go, why? And they go, well, because you're too talk radio and not enough NPR radio. And, and what they meant by that is I've just got too much enthusiasm and stuff. <laughs> they want that somnolent like NPR sound. So I, I, I went to that. We did another pilot. They did pick it up. And over the years, I've been sneaking in my enthusiasm. <laughs> and so finally, they told me they've renamed this, the show. It's now called Talking Foreign Policy with Michael Scharf. And they want me to be all talk radio because <laughs> apparently that's what our listeners like. So, so that's what you're going to get. All right. Yemen. <laughs> A nation of 27 million people that occupies one of the most strategic locations in the world. Since 2014, it's been engulfed in the bloodiest conflict on the planet. The war pits the Houthi rebels, backed by Iran, against the former government, backed by a Saudi-led coalition. War crimes on all sides are rampant. Over 70,000 people have been killed. 18 million are on the verge of starvation. And three million Yemenis have been forced from their homes. Last spring, President Trump used his second ever veto to prevent Congress from cutting off the billions of dollars the U.S. has been pouring into this far-flung war. Earlier this week, the Houthi rebels took credit for airstrikes that destroyed Saudi Arabian oil refineries, causing a spike in the global price of oil. Yet, polls indicate that the American people are largely oblivious to the situation in Yemen. In this roundtable, we've assembled a panel of experts on international law, peace negotiations, and war crimes to untangle the Yemen crisis. Joining us today is Paul Williams, the president of the Public International Law and Policy Group, a Nobel Peace Prize nominated NGO that has provided legal counsel in a dozen peace negotiations over the past 22 years, including in Yemen. And I should add that Paul was just here two weeks ago delivering the Klatsky Lecture and getting the Cox Center's Humanitarian of the Year Award. Congratulations, Paul. <laughs> Also from PILPG, we have, and, and you never say pill big, okay? It's, it's <laughs> PILPG. We have Margot Day, senior counsel and newly elevated vice president of the NGO. Margot has been deeply involved in PILPG's work in Yemen. I should mention that Margot is an alumna of our school and will be receiving the distinguished recent alumni award at our reunion dinner next month. Also, if you happen to go on the other side of that wall, you'll notice that this law school was the last American school to win the Jessup World Championship. That was Margot Day, who argued the finals and won. Now, also on the panel is Sandy Hodgkinson, Senior Vice President for Strategic Planning and Chief of Staff at Leonardo DRS. 
Sandy has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, Deputy Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues at the State Department, Director for International Justice at the National Security Council, and Senior Advisor at the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad, Iraq. That's only a small part of her resume. She recently retired from the Navy JAG with the rank of Captain. Thank you for being with us, Sandy. We are also joined by Professor Milena Stereo of Cleveland State's Marshall College of Law, a renowned international law expert. Milena recently participated with Margot Day in a meeting in Jordan with the Yemeni prosecutors and judges to discuss accountability options for Yemen. And um, although, uh, Milena, you presented me with the award today, congratulations as well. <laughs> There's a lot of work that went into that, um, and, and we are very, very happy to have that on behalf of all the authors. And next to Milena is Jim Johnson, the director of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law's Henry King War Crimes Research Office and former chief of prosecutions of the Special Court for Sierra Leone under David Crane, who's out there in the audience as well. Jim recently launched the Yemen Accountability Project at Case Western, which aims to map the war crimes committed during the conflict. And finally, but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Graham, a former professor of genocide studies at Tufts University who is currently a 2L student at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Laura is the director of our Yemen Accountability Project, which has a staff of 70 student volunteers. Let's start with a refresher on the history of the Yemeni situation. It's a complex war, and you probably need a scorecard to keep track of the warring parties. Paul Williams, you were in Yemen when the Civil War broke out. You were there when bombs flew over and around your hotel room. Can you tell us about the different sides of the conflict and what they are fighting for? Well, Michael Scharf, uh, <laughs> for a bit of a background on the conflict, um, you want to think about it as a Rubik's Cube. It's multi-dimensional and with so many sub-parties on each side or on each dimension. When you look at the domestic parties, you have the Houthis, uh, you have the former government, uh, the GPC, General People's Congress, uh, as it's called, which have lined up on one side. On the other side, you have the current government uh, by President Hadi, which he's based in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and he's formed a coalition with a number of southern forces, and you would call them the Adenite forces from the city of Aden, you would then have additional forces from the province of Aden, and then you have a third set of southern forces from Hadramat, and we'll get to that a little bit later in the program of some of the tension that that's created. You then have dozens of local tribes, which are essentially militia for hire, depending on which side has the resources and the geographic proximity. Add to this, then, a spill-in conflict, where the Iranians have decided that the Houthis make a great proxy to antagonize the Saudis, who are supporting the government in exile. You then have the UAE, which is brought in with the Saudis. You then have the Americans, the French, and the British, which are selling weapons, providing intelligence, providing aerial refueling, providing targeting assistance, possibly, to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. You have Sudanese troops that also were for rent and were brought in to fight in Sudan. And then throw in a mix of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and mix it all up, and you'll never figure out this Rubik's Cube. Okay, and, and some of those names like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, I recognize, but are there good guys and bad guys in this conflict? And, and which side is the United States on? There are 24.9 million good guys. Those are the civilians okay. who are trying to find their way out of this conflict. There are then 100,000 bad guys, the guys with guns, who somehow think that this stream of killing, the stream of atrocities, the stream of aerial bombardment, will somehow bring about peace to Yemen. And the difficulty is we and many of our allies have cast our lot with the armed solution to this conflict. There's no one on the side of use of force in this conflict that you could characterize as the good guys, so to mm. speak. And there's 24.9 million Yemenis that are suffering as a result of our fixation on the guys with guns. All right, so Jim Johnson, 
As someone who has personally prosecuted crimes against humanity before an international tribunal, who are the victims of this conflict and, and what kind of victimization are we seeing? You know, Michael, before I go into that, I would just like to let everybody know that I advocated that we just play the video <laughs> of the radio broadcast that would not this be spring fun. because Michael has just recycled the exact same <laughs> script. <laughs> <laughs> but but <laughs> anyway, I digress. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping the surprise will be in your answer. <laughs> it's a classic. But uh, as with any conflict like this, the the victims are are the civilians, the young, the old, the farmer, the, the those not taking a direct part in the hostilities. The UN has estimated close to 20,000 civilian casualties between 2015 and 2019. That's probably a gross underestimate of the actual casualties. But again, it's those not holding a weapon. It's those that are starving. It's those that are dying from disease. And those that are killed in apparently indiscriminate attacks by all of the parties to the conflict. All right. So. The United Nations has described this as the worst humanitarian crisis on the planet. Just to put some context to that, Melina Stereo, how does this carnage compare with Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Burma, some of the other places we've been talking about at this conference? Sure. So it is hard to put um, a comparative value on this and say that this is somehow worse or better than Syria or Libya or, or Afghanistan. But just to give you some context here, um, according to um, an organization called the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, as of June 2011, more than 90,000 Yemenis have been killed since 2015. So just over four years, more than 90,000 90, Yemenis have been killed. But in addition to this, uh, close to 80% of Yemen's population of nearly 30 million people is in need of some form of humanitarian assistance with more than 20 million people who are food insecure and 7.4 7 million who are at risk of famine. And so here we have violence, warfare, all the different competing factions, as Paul has pointed out, coupled with a very poor country and these dire con conditions in terms of disease, poverty, and food insecurity. Wow, so it sounds absolutely horrible, but Margot Day, why do you think most Americans are not paying attention to the Yemeni situation? It's a particularly interesting time to ask that question since the UN envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffith, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times this week essentially asking Americans to care and hearkened back to about a year ago when Mike Pompeo and Jim Mattis called explicitly for a ceasefire in Yemen. And I think bringing to light the fact that it's been about a year and asking what's happening. I think in the US, the discourse around Yemen is always tied to our relationship with Saudi Arabia, rather than looking at the conflict separate from the US relationship with Saudi Arabia. So you saw about a year ago with the murder of Kosaji, um, Congress taking a larger role um, set the Senate asking for the president to remove troops, um, calling out the uh, Mohammed bin Salam for the responsibility of the murder, and stating that there's no statutory authorization for engagement. So if we accept this premise that Saudi Ara the relationship with Saudi Arabia is what makes Americans care more, I think it is possible we'll see an uptick now with the recent attacks on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. All right, so we've got the deaths, we've got the Saudi part of this. Um, Sandy Hodgkinson, is there any other reason why Yemen should be seen as strategically important to the United States? Well, I think, I mean, I think obviously it's, it starts with the deaths. It starts with the fact that the United States cares about promoting freedom and promoting accountability. So that is extremely important. Um, I think the relationship with Saudi Arabia is important. I mean, it is, it, it, it would be nice to not think about that, but the, the relationship with Saudi Arabia is why we have such an important stronghold in this part of the Middle East. And it hinges on the stability of the whole region. Um, the Saudis have been consistently pushing back threats from Iran through through time. Um, the Saudis and our partnership there has played a key role in stabilizing both Jordan and Egypt through our training of their forces, through the partnership capabilities, and through all the things we've tried to do to keep it, you know, strategically enough safe there. Um, 
It's also for a couple other reasons. I mean, one, the Arabian Peninsula is, you know, one of the most strategic places in the world for the flow of oil coming out of the Middle East. And so it's absolutely essential that we have a strong partner in the Middle East, in that region, to help us make sure that the Straits of Hormuz remain open for the transport of oil. It's about a third of the world's oil that comes out of there. Um, and while it may be 21 miles wide, there's only about two miles wide where certain ships can come through. So it's strategically important there from the perspective of the Straits of Hormuz. Um, further, if you go beyond just the, the oil production and the location, um, it's Yemen is also strategically located um, in a very important location with the Strait Bab al-Mandeb there which basically allows the flow of, of people coming up from northern Africa, from Somalia, from Djibouti, and some from other dangerous areas into Yemen. Um, and then I would just lastly say that it's of strategic significance now because of the broader fight with Al-Qaeda. I mean, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has taken a stronghold in this area. First, in, in, in keeping them out of Saudi Arabia, they're now really centrally uh, focused in Yemen. So for all of those reasons, I think it is of, of strong strategic importance to the United States. Well, in addition to that, could you comment on how some view this as a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia and what the strategic implications of that might be? Well, the, the relationship between you know, the, the Saudi kingdom and Iran has been challenged for decades. I mean, it goes back to both of them vying to be the most important influence in the region, um, and that was challenged based on you know, the Iranian Revolution, 1979. I mean, it dates way back and stems from the differing religious sects that are in the majority. So the Saudi kingdom is primarily Sunni-led, and the Iranian influence is primarily Shia. And it's been a battle for different countries throughout the region for the past several decades. And so this conflict is in the backdrop of the fight over Yemen, which has had a Sunni and Shia influences in there, in addition to al-Qaeda that's come in and taken advantage of the weakness and, and the instruggling. And so... While that decades-long conflict is still present in the area with Iran being backed, you know, at different times by the Russians and also by some of the Iraqis and by parts of the Lebanese government, you have, you know, the Saudi kingdom being backed primarily by the rest of the coalition that's trying to, again, make sure that we stabilize Yemen, which I think is in Saudi kingdom's interests. Um, again, because of the illegal, the flow of illegal immigrants coming in from northern Africa and elsewhere, because of the food instability. So all of that, Yemen's kind of caught in the middle of these two big actors. And I'm thinking back a couple of years ago when ISIS was operating solely in Syria. Nobody really cared that much about it. President Obama said they were the JV team, not the varsity, until they attacked the French discotheque and athletic facilities um, in Paris. And suddenly everybody wanted to do something about ISIS. Do you think the attack on the oil refinery earlier this week is a moment like that? I mean, I think it is. I mean, if you're, if you're following it closely, there have been a lot of these attacks, right? This has been happening to the Saudis for a while now, and they've been concerned about it. I mean, it's one reason they keep coming back to the U.S. seeking additional help, is to protect their oil, to protect their palaces, because they feel under attack. But this particular attack, because of the way it was carried out, the fact that it knocked out about half of their oil production overnight, um, which is 5% of the world's uh, oil population, um, and, the, and the, we saw the petroleum prices go up. It's just that moment that got captured that encapsulates the whole mm. thing. So I think but it that is could a be the tipping moment. point, game changing moment. Yeah, I think it's a significant moment. moment as a result. Well, good timing for this conference, I guess. Um, let's turn to Laura Graham. You and your team have been documenting the war crimes in Yemen. Tell us about the atrocities. Who are the main perpetrators? What are you finding? Yeah, so um, some of the atrocities that we're finding is that uh, perpetrators are using indiscriminate uh, attacks on the civilian population. So they're using cluster bombs uh, to attack civilian sites, such as hospitals, sites of worship, and marketplaces. Um, we're also seeing starvation used as a weapon of <coughs> warfare. Um, 13 million Yemeni are at risk of starvation, and over 1,000 people died in 2017 from cholera due to attacks on the water supply. 
We're also seeing attacks on fishing villages, which is one of the main sources of food in Yemen. In fact, over 200 fishermen were killed um, all along the Red Sea coast. Um, and this is actually happening uh, on all sides. So you have uh, the Houthi rebels that are committing some of these attacks on the marketplaces, um, and they are, of course, backed by Iran. But we also have the Yemeni government and military, which is being prompted, uh, supported by uh, the Saudi-led coalition, which is dropping a lot of the bombs. Okay, so the United States provided $4.5 billion in arms to Saudi Arabia last year. Let me ask Jim Johnson, an expert in military law with 30 years of experience in JAG and as an international prosecutor, do you believe that these arms are being used to facilitate the war crimes in Yemen, which your colleague Laura has just described? <clears throat> yeah, I think at this point in time on the evidence and reports that we're, I mean, we're far from a conviction <clears throat> in a tribunal and accountability that we hope we'll find down the road. But certainly looking at the reports coming out, many of these crimes and atrocities and attacks on civilians are being, uh, are being looked at at the Saudi-led coalition, that the Saudis are involved in these, and they're using U.S. weapons, quite frankly. And so it's not a great leap at this point in time to say that U.S. weapons and other types of U.S. assistance being sold to the coalition forces are being used to perpetuate these crimes. Now, Sandy, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you look from your earlier comments like you might be a little more sympathetic to the Saudis. What's your take on that? Well, I think, I, I think it always becomes complicated. I mean, it's easy to say that because we produce the weapons and they ultimately get into the hands of bad doers that were somehow complicit in that. And I think the facts have to be very carefully looked at. I mean, a lot of the allegations here against the civilian attacks have been about the targeting process that the Saudis have used. And, you know, whether or not the United States is actually as part of the coalition had anything to do with deciding which targets would be carried out and, and done that sort of proportionality analysis, I don't know. I think the facts will, will be presented on all sides in that case. Yeah, I, um, and yes, we're certainly Jim. a ways from saying that the U.S. is guilty of aiding and abetting, but of course your question was, do, does it appear that U.S. weapons are being used? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about efforts to find peace. In the earlier panels today, there was a lot of conversation about the U.N. Security Council. Paul, what has been the role of the U.N. Security Council in this conflict, and what are the politics of the permanent members relating to Yemen? So this is an interesting situation where if we take Stephen's panel from earlier today and flip it upside down, it hasn't been where the permanent members have been using their veto to stop action. It's where the permanent members have been using their privileged position to lock in what they think the outcome of this conflict should be. So early on in the spring of 2015, the Saudi Arabian-led coalition working with the Americans, the British, and the French was able to get to two resolutions, first uh, chapter six, and then a chapter seven resolution, essentially saying this is the outline of any negotiated settlement. The Houthis have to cease fire, they have to withdraw, they have to return to the legitimate government. All good things and all things we would support, but it was basically the Saudi dictating to the Security Council what this negotiated outcome would look like, which has tied the hands of the mediator as they go in they're going into a negotiation with a Security Council Chapter 7 binding under threat to national peace and security outline of what that peace agreement has to be. So in an odd way, again, I think they thought it was going to be a quick, you know, they didn't really pay attention to what the Saudis weren't saying, um, that they were being tactical instead of strategic. They thought it was going to be a quick three-month air campaign. The Houthis would come and say, we surrender, and then these were the terms of surrender. But they haven't taken any action since then. So this continues to govern. What was the date of that? Uh, this was in April, and then again in May of 2015. Oh, so it's been four years and they haven't moved. But in June of 2019, a high court in the UK said arms sales to Saudi Arabia are illegal, and they've wound down those sales. So you might find with that as a beachhead to begin to shift some change in the Security Council. And then you'll bump up against the vetoes. I'm going to end. Those of you who've heard me chit-chat in the past before know I'm no fan of the Russians. In the spring of 2015, <laughs> the Russians put forward a draft resolution for a humanitarian pause. And they were told, if it comes to the Security Council, we'll veto it. Oh. So not often that you see the Russians out there waving a humanitarian pause. Um, 
didn't get very far. That's fascinating. So, Malena and Margo, a couple of months ago, you were in meetings in Jordan with individuals involved in the Yemeni peace process. We've heard what the structure was that was developed by the Security Council four years ago. What is the current status of the peace negotiations based on your experience? So let me just start. So um, there were peace talks held in December of 2018 in Stockholm where, um, and, and these were conducted under the auspices of the UN envoy for, for Yemen between the um, Yemen government and the Houthi rebels. And there was um, a ceasefire that was negotiated at, at, at those talks. In, um, in addition to that, there was a prisoner exchange provision in, in this you know, ceasefire agreement that was negotiated. And also as part of the agreement, the Houthis were supposed to give up um, their control of the port of Hodeida, which is a very strategic, important port, because that's the corridor through which all the humanitarian assistance is supposed to um, arrive and help the Yemeni population. It is somewhat unclear as to what the, st what, what the implementation of the agreement looks like. It appears that some of the provisions of the agreement were implemented, but at the same time, we know that there have been attacks launched um, by the Houthi rebels as recently as, um, I think we mentioned it earlier, but the attacks um, against the Saudi Arabian um, oil production facility, the Houthi rebels were the first ones to come forward and claim responsibility. Margaret, what do you want to add? And the Stockholm Agreement from December 2018 is still the only agreement that we have on the table. And with those two localized ceasefires, neither of them have held. One was in Hudaydah, as Malena said, and then the other is in Taz, which is the most um, populous governorate in Yemen. Even within the past 24 hours, we've seen the Saudi-led coalition have four attacks on Hudaydah port, or just north of the port. Um, so the fragile uh, kind of ceasefire that we have in place, I think, is at real risk. And then we've also seen just this month some fracturing even among the coalition members itself. So now we kind of have a side peace process in Jeddah that was going on a couple weeks ago where the southern movement and the Hadi government who are supposedly on the same side actually needed their own mediation to determine how to go forward in the process as well. So really even though this has been going, um, this process itself or the current iteration of it has been going on for a couple years, we're still at the confidence building measure phase. We're still talking about prisoner exchanges like Melena said, we're still talking about localized ceasefires. And there's been no significant progress whatsoever on a further peace process agenda. And this is all sort of in the abstract, but Paul Williams, you were literally in Yemen engaging in peace talks as the legal advisor to UN envoy Jamal Benamar from 2011 to 2014. Can you tell us about that experience? What was the flavor of those talks? Well, there were two important phases in the peace negotiations in Yemen. The first was the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC agreement reached in 2011. Um, and there was one striking aspect of that agreement, and that was that Article 1A provided for immunity for President Saleh and other leading members of the GPC. And so we'll park that for a second. But that was the very beginning of, of the process, and that was the negotiation of guys with guns. But they then moved into a national dialogue and a constitution drafting process, which was stunningly inclusive. And we've done it together, you know, a number of these negotiations around the globe. This was the most inclusive process. There were 535 members of the national dialogue from all of the different dimensions of Yemeni society. They had seven different working groups, including a working group on transitional justice. I remember taking a picture of it and texting it to Dave Crane and being like, I'm in a peace process with a working group on transitional justice. Um, and then, of course, a few days later, someone had torn the sign in half and then put it back into a uh, plastic holder because they weren't too enthused about the idea of being held accountable. Um, but there was, there, was, there was a lot of energy, let's just say, around this, this national dialogue. Uh, they then had a constitution drafting process where there was, where there was a, a representative um, uh, selection of individuals based on gender, based on youth, based on party, based on geography. Um, and this was all coming to a point where the president's representative took a draft of the Constitution, got into his car, and was going to Parliament to prevent, present the draft Constitution, and he was kidnapped by the Houthis. And the Constitution was torn up and discarded, and then we've plunged into this conflict that we've had for the last few years. So we're okay, almost so, there, and then it collapsed. So besides looking out for what kind of car you get into, what are the lessons you think <laughs> they learned from that experience? 
And there were two lessons. One was, wow, it's amazing how they were able to build an inclusive process. And it was amazing how quickly that inclusive process disintegrated. So at the tail end, after they had torn up the constitutions and the Houthis had occupied Sana, we were in the Movenpick, and the envoy was doing ceasefire negotiations. And there were eight gentlemen, well, there were eight men on this side, and there were eight men on this side. And I'm like, wait, where did all the diversity, inclusion go? Um, and the envoy said, well, wait, what happened? He said, well, this, this is ceasefire. This is men's work. Um, and they're all about how they're going to divide the country up and who's going to get what and where they have rotating prime ministers. And then the doors of the room we were using for the negotiations in the Movenpick literally burst open. And the woman's delegation from the National Dialogue came and basically sat down and said, we're joining the ceasefire negotiations. And the envoy grinned ear to ear because he had basically arranged this to happen. <laughs> um, and there was that immediate tension between, no, no, ceasefire, men's work, guys with guns, go back and, and do national dialogue. Um, and I think that had they maintained that structure, you may have actually had an effective ceasefire. Now, the other quick lesson, and I'm going to get my high sign from the timekeepers, is throughout the entire negotiations, everyone said, you know, if we don't reach you know, negotiated settlement, this will tip into war, and it'll be terrible, and it'll be long-lasting, and lots of people will die, and yada, yada, yada. Um, turns out it was true. Yeah. So when you're in these negotiations, and there's this specter of atrocities and, and horror that will happen if the negotiations don't succeed, it's actually true. And so when we do kick back into serious negotiations, we know it's going to be true. And so we have to double our efforts on these negotiations to be as inclusive as possible and to not be granting immunity. So a few minutes ago, Margot mentioned that in the UK, a court ruled that the UK had to stop the arms support for Saudi Arabia. And there are experts that believe the best chance for winding down the war at this point <laughs> is to increase US pressure on Saudi Arabia to end its aerial bombing campaign, and to more actively pursue a peace deal with the Houthi rebels. What, what's your take on that? We joined the Saudi coalition on the basis of a tactical plan with no strategy. There still is no strategy. Unless the Americans can come up with a strategy for helping the Saudis win the war, and we can pretty much assume that the Americans have been trying to do that, um, and assume that there is no strategy, then this is simply a tactical conflict where the Saudis-led coalition will continue to make a final peace more and more difficult. So it's time for the Americans to sit down with our Saudi allies and say, yeah, you can't win this war. You can only negotiate an end to it. Find whatever face-saving mechanism, find whatever timing is right vis-a-vis, -vis, get the Iranians to stop blowing things up in the Persian Gulf for a little while so you can create that space. But we don't have a strategy for winning the war. We ought to develop a strategy for getting to peace. And, and the U.S. Congress seems to be on board with that approach. This next question for you law students in the crowd gets to the heart of the separation of powers and the relationships between the president and the legislative branch. So both houses of Congress voted last spring to suspend American military assistance to Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. The vote was actually 257 to 176 in the House and 54 to 46 in the Senate. But President Trump just recently, or after that, vetoed the legislation. Now, Melinda Stereo, you teach all kinds of constitutional and international law classes. What strategies could Congress pursue in the future to prevent continued provision of arms to Saudi Arabia for the use in Yemen, given that the president has said he's going to veto these efforts. Sure, so before I answer that question, Michael, I can resist, but go back to something that Paul said. Paul, I've heard you speak at other panels when President Obama was in office, and you were critical of some of the foreign policy under the Obama administration, and I heard you once say something about, you know, the foreign policy in the Middle East is where is Waldo. And I would just think, I would just argue that the Trump administration policy for the Middle East is where is Waldo on steroids. <laughs> Nobody knows. But uh, to, to, to go back to, I, I couldn't resist, sorry. <laughs> so, Michael, to go back to um, your question, so this does go to the heart of our separation of powers um, uh, principles, our constitutional law principles. So, Congress has has uh, voted 
laws that President Trump had vetoed. Now Congress can override the presidential veto with two thirds of the votes, but Don't in this political votes. climate, that's not going to happen. Now Congress could keep voting additional resolutions, additional laws, in order to try to pressure the White House into, you know, not selling additional weapons. Into could not they like add this? onto something that is really popular that the president yeah, wouldn't sure. want to Sure, so veto. Congress, there are all sorts of congressional strategies to do things of this sort, so you could attach it to another resolution that, that, as you said, is something that is super popular, and you sort of attach it as an addendum and then hope that that, that, that passes. Um, um, you know, ultimately, the other thing that Congress can do, Congress has the power of the purse under our constitutional system, so Congress can try to restrict funds. Now, there are ways of getting around that because there are sort of uh, non earmarked funds funds in the de defense department that, that in the de defense budget that could be used so there's all sorts of like back and forth but in terms of the political picture i think the best thing the congress can do is tr you know to to keep passing more laws and resolutions restricting the sales of weapons and trying to put more pressure on the white house to actually you know not not pursue this a as aggressively anymore and, and interestingly just to update us on supreme court jurisprudence um, even earmarked money could potentially be funneled because that's what the Supreme Court said that the Trump administration could do in building its wall exactly. in the southern border, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, now, we've been talking about the Saudi part of the equation. Sandy, you spent a lot of time in Iraq. You dealt with rebels um, and the challenges they posed. How can the militias be convinced to give up their arms? I mean, it's, it's always extremely complicated. I mean, the peace process is obviously going to have the main parties as their focus, and they're going to try to find a way to, you know, bring in the Houthis through some sort of a political party, whether it's the Ansarullah party or some way that they can bring them to the table, um, you know, and where, as Margot reports, you know, right now there's still sort of local village by local village coming up with ceasefires. So with the militias, just the same as with anyone, you're going to have to come up with something they want. And it has to be what they will negotiate for to have local peace. And it can be as simple as, you know, funds, food, representation, but it has to be what they want. It can't, there isn't necessarily going to be one big settlement that makes everybody happy. Um, and, and it's a tactical matter. You have to figure out how to get the weapons back. And, you know, we've tried all kinds of ways in the past to get rebels to turn in weapons, whether it's through a financial incentive, whether it's through something their families may need, again, through political representation. Um, and it's going to be tough because, you know, it's, har it's much harder to negotiate with a rebel group that's attached to al-Qaeda, as we've seen in the past. Um, whereas with the Taliban, for example, we've had splintering factions. We've been able to get some progress with village by village. Um, but it's going to be a long protracted process. I mean, I agree with Paul that it's not going to be one with military force at this point. Um, but they have to feel that there's something they can get out of this process or they're just not going to put their arms down. All right. So we have our carrots, we have our sticks, but in the end, it's all about power. Uh, Paul, what might be a mutually acceptable compromise between the parties on the distribution of power in Yemen? Yeah, there's, there's two aspects of this. One is that you're, you're going to need some degree of devolution of, of power. Um, and you know, this harkens back to a conversation that you and I once had in Misrata. And you and I were asking the Misratans, um, you know, why is it that you're so focused on, on being in power? Um, you only really control a certain percentage of the country. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to be in power. Um, we just don't want anybody else to be in power um, because they'll then abuse that power against us. And, and if we're in power, then we won't abuse that power and, and all will be well. Um, all hasn't been well in Libya. All hasn't been well in Yemen. And so no party is going to trust the other party to basically control a unitary state. So you're going to need some level of devolution. The other aspect that you're going to need as you sort of figure out how to distribute this power is some type of process that is inclusive and isn't manipulated along the way to disenfranchise one of the parties. And you know, you know Jim and Laura have pointed out in, in detail the number of atrocities that, that the Houthis have, have committed and there's no excuse and they need to be held accountable. Part of why this process, this conflict, this tipped into a conflict was when they designed the various provinces, they said, hmm, we got to screw somebody because there's not enough for everything. So there's these three provinces in the middle of, of Yemen that no one really wants because there's no access to the sea and there's no access to the oil. And the Houthis are at the top 
and we kind of have to give the different groups a number of provinces, so let's give them these three provinces in the middle that don't have access to the resources because we can get away with it because they're politically disenfranchised. They rang their friends Iran, they were no longer disenfranchised, uh, and we are where we are. But you're going to need a process that is inclusive even of the folks that have gone from what the Houthis were to being you know, high, Houthis with teeth, and it's going to be even more difficult to include them in the process, but that kind of compromise is going to be necessary. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States American Bar Association and other NGOs spent an awful lot of time trying to export the American system to Eastern Europe. And one of the most successful aspects of that, not just there, but in Yugoslavia and some of these other conflict places, has been federalism, you know, invented here in the United States. But it does seem to be an answer to some of these kinds of challenges. Margo, have, have you been exploring that with the Yemen? So I think a devolved structure might be the one thing that the Houthis, the Hadi government, and even the southern movements agree needs to exist if there's one Yemen that comes out of this process. So as Paul referenced, you saw the Hadi government um, propose a six regional federal system at the end of the national dialogue. In March of this year, the Houthis published their national vision where they also said that there needs to be a devolved system with a central and um, power with some of the local governors as well. And then the southern movements, if they're not asking for a complete secession, they're saying that the southern governorates need to have significant power for them to be able to agree to have a one Yemen at the outcome of this. So like Paul said, like you said, I think this is the way forward and this is the system that we're going to have to be pushing. And then there are places like Somalia that have for decades been so poor that they have been places that have encouraged the rise of terrorists and drug traffickers and pirates. Well, Yemen, too, is among the poorest of the states in the world. Malena, how should the international community approach its reconstruction if we get to that point? Sure. So just, just a small correction before that. The former Yugoslavia was known as the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, so oh. it had a federalist system. I, I, I you know, <laughs> I come from there, so I know a little bit about that. And, 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 North, <laughs> Car and North Korea is North. called the um, Democratic Republic right. of North Korea, so <laughs> um, <laughs> putting that out. <laughs> presidency? Anyway, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so on Yemen, um, Reconstruction in Yemen is going to entail many different things. So obviously you have to start with um, a, a, a peace agreement and ceasefire, but then you have to engage in political reconstruction, which would in include institution building, which would include things like constitution drafting, like finding that constitution that you lost in the taxi. You know? <laughs> so, you know, constitu institution building, constitution drafting, the building of a um, federal system, perhaps, if, if, if that's what turns out to be the best solution, essentially coming up with the power sharing structure. But then it's also going to include things like economic reconstruction. Obviously, this is one of the poorest countries in the world, so economic development is going to be needed. All the recent um, development programs run by the UN, by, run by the World Bank, seems to indicate that human rights-based approaches attached to development work best, and I think that's really, really important in a country um, like Yemen, where a part of the um, economic reconstruction also, I think, has to be um, linked to um, the rebuilding of social cohesion, human rights, rule of law. So I think we have, you know, even assuming that there's a ceasefire, you know, tomorrow, um, I think we have a lot of work, you know, for, with the involvement of the international community to make sure that Yemen is in a, is in a good like, place. Like a Marshall Plan for Yemen. Does, exactly. Does the world have a stomach for that under its current economic conditions? Well, that goes, to, that goes back to your question about, you know, like, does the United States care about Yemen, right? And unfortunately, we viewed Yemen through the lens of Saudi Arabia and Iran, right? That, that this is somehow a Saudi Arabian, you know, it, it, you know, we want to make sure that the, you know, sort of a good guy supported by Saudi Arabia come into power and not the bad guys backed by Iran. I think that's really, really unfortunate. And hopefully, more folks in the international community realize that this is a country that needs our help. So we've been talking a lot about how to achieve peace, but we've said in other panels that you can't ignore prosecution. Jim Johnson, from your experience as a prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, do you think the imposition of accountability on those responsible for atrocity crimes in Yemen would hinder the chances of achieving peace there? Well, <coughs> Michael, let me first say that I think your question 
kind of assumes that if you don't imposition accountability, that if you have provisions for amnesty and immunity, that that will promote the peace process. And I'm not sure that there's any evidence to support that proposition. Uh, certainly with our experience in going into Sierra Leone, one of the primary peace accords provided amnesty for all of those fighting in it, and that peace accord lasted not very long, and immediately fighting broke out. And so, so I certainly wouldn't take that proposition either. From my standpoint, certainly in my travels around Sierra Leone, David before me, and then I spent years traveling around Sierra Leone, holding dozens of town hall meetings, uh, the, justice was important. And, and I'm a firm believer that you can't have long-lasting, stable peace without some kind of justice or some kind of accountability me mechanisms. When I was out at these town hall meetings, particularly after the conviction of Charles Taylor, and we go out and talk to the people of Sierra Leone about the conviction, uh, there was always three questions that I got, and I'll just deal one of those now, but one of those questions is, what about him over there, and what about him over there? Because they cut my hand off, because they hurt me, and what about justice for them? For me, for them. And so I think to, I think to create a long-lasting, stable peace, there has to be an accountability mechanism. And, and so I don't buy into the other proposition that by having amnesty will create a long-lasting peace. Now, before there was Sierra Leone, there was Bosnia. And Paul, you were at the Dayton peace negotiations right here in Ohio. Um, was accountability an obstacle to those peace negotiations? How did it play out there? It was interesting, and I, I very much shared the view of, of Jim on this, um, that accountability isn't uh, a bar to a negotiated peace settlement, and it wasn't a bar to the Dayton peace negotiations, despite the fact that the American government was possessed by the notion that it might be a bar to those negotiations. So in hindsight, it appears that the Yugoslav tribunal under the leadership of Prosecutor Goldstone, enabled the Bosnian peace process to actually occur. He indicted Karadzic, Radovan Karadzic, uh, and Ratko Mladic, and where's Roy? We, thanks, we saw the pictures uh, last night of Rad Radovan Karadzic. He was indicted before the Dayton peace negotiations, and that kept him out of the negotiations, and it kept General Mladic out of the negotiations, and allowed them to continue. But there wasn't enough accountability. You know, many of us who track the implementation of the Dayton Accords and the political stalemate and the economic stalemate and the potential for return to violence in Bosnia at the moment realized that it was a deeply flawed peace agreement. And the reality is that Dayton is a deeply flawed peace agreement because three of the four signatories of the Dayton Accords were either indicted or indictable for war crimes. Slobodan Milosevic signed the Dayton Peace Accords, subsequently indicted. Radovan um, Krajicnik signed the peace accords, subsequently indicted. Tujman, president of Croatia, signed the peace accords. Del Ponte said, well, if he hadn't died, I was going to mm -hmm. indict him. It was President Izbegovic of Bosnia, who was the only one that wasn't indicted or indictable. And so actually, had we had more accountability and not less, we would have had a much more functional consequence or much more functional peace process. And I think we shouldn't be shy. Yesterday, Todd Buckwald mentioned we shouldn't be shy about um, having U.S. foreign policy led by our commitment to moral values. I also think we shouldn't be shy about leading with accountability when it comes to peace negotiations. It works. Now, Melina Sturro, you have written that one of the ways to reconcile this tension between striving for peace and striving for accountability is sequencing. Can you describe how that works? Sure. So there's this notion that there's a tension between peace and accountability because, as Paul, Paul described, uh, some fear that um, if accountability is part, you know, accountability is still on the table, that means that the bad guys who are indictable will not come to the negotiating table, and there won't be peace, you know, unless you promise them blanket amnesty. And we know from the Dayton peace agreement and from some other examples that that's not necessarily true. But at times, one must be strategic about this, and you have to essentially think about sequencing peace and accountability. So you might be in a position where peace and a ceasefire are your immediate goals, but then accountability is your next goal, right? Or in other situations, it might be that you pursue accountability and hope that that will lead you to a ceasefire as uh, the Dayton peace agreement perhaps demonstrates. So that it's not an either or proposition, but it's a question of sequencing and timing. Well, how do you know which, which way you're in? 
Well, so for example, um, in Dayton, that was a strategic choice to say, you know, come to the table. Um, Karadzic was already um, indicted, so he couldn't come, right? So it was very important to remove him, but it was important to essentially entice others to come, and perhaps had they already been indicted, they wouldn't have come. So I think it's very context-specific, depends on every situation. Now, when I did my introductions, and I mentioned Jim and Laura, I described the fact that you guys have launched the Yemen Accountability Project here at Case Western. Would the two of you tell us about that? Sure. So the Yemen Accountability Project is a student-led organization based here at Case. Uh, we currently have around 70 students that are involved in the project, both here at Case, also um, at Cleveland Marshall, and at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, as part of that project, we are looking at documenting evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity that have occurred in Yemen, identifying the most responsible parties for those crimes and the most egregious incidents with the aim of assisting uh, future prosecutions and accountability processes. Jim, do you want to add anything? Uh, just that what do you have to do with all that She stuff? left out the student at Emory. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> um, how many of you in the audience are students involved in the Yemen Accountability Project? All right, well, for all of you, a big hand. So. All right, so you guys are going to have what products based on this? So uh, the investigations team is looking at the, the raw data and they are putting that together in a conflict narrative. Uh, we also are creating a crime-based uh, matrix uh, and we have a registrar division that is looking at producing white papers. In fact, they're currently working very diligently on a white paper that is investigating aiding and abetting uh, criminal responsibility for states and organizations who have uh, sold weapons to, uh, to perpetrators in in the conflict. And, and I do want to point out a little shout out to David Crane because all of this is modeled after the very successful Syria accountability project that you started at Syracuse. And David was here yesterday talking to your, your group and he's going to be taking them out for office hours as he claims <laughs> afterwards. Um, and so you guys are very lucky to have David as a mentor and advisor to your project. Now, I want to follow up on the last thing you said. All right, so <laughs> you're looking at the possibility of aiders and abettors, including states. Margot tells us that the um, courts in the UK have said that they, the UK cannot give any more um, financial assistance or military assistance to Saudi Arabia because that is aiding and abetting. Jim Johnson, you suggested it might be, and then you started to like, you know, <laughs> pull back a little bit. But let me ask you guys, is there a potential criminal case against the United States? I, yes, I think there clearly is. How does or, that or certainly case a look? criminal case against individuals. Yeah. And uh, our tribunals don't, cry, don't try states, but try individuals for their personal actions. But uh, yes, I mean, we're a long ways from a prosecution and a conviction, but yes, you look at a recent UN report that came out saying that the United States, Britain, and France may be complicit. You've got the UK action. You've got the uh, US Congress that you talked about just a little bit ago, and their concerns about the support that we're providing All right, to so Saudi Arabia. If until or unless there is a change in the um, the regime in the United States, we'll just call it that, um, does this mean that the U.S. is going to resist all efforts at accountability, knowing that there's a chance that the, the focus will be on U.S. officials? I am not going to go down that road. I'll, I'll leave that to, <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that to someone else here. But, but if I could, you know, just, just add and, and let everybody kind of draw their own conclusions. When you look at uh, aiding and abetting, there's really three elements. You're looking at the a war crime has been committed. You're looking at another actor had a su substantial effect on the commission of that war crime. And that the other actor knew that such act would assist or had the substantial likelihood of assisting in the commission of the war crime. So you take that and, you know, on its face, there's concerns. Sandy, what were you going to say? No, I, I was simply going to say, you know, I, I don't think that it will particularly deter the U.S.'s, you know, decisions at this point. I think, I think you know, the, the notion of accountability, because I don't think they think that will probably happen. I do think that it will, 
certainly color the the relationship and the idea that we provide weapons to Saudi Arabia in this case. I, mean, I think that will become mm. the debate. And so it may not be the actual threat of prosecution that I think deters conduct, but it will be, you know, the the notion that the United States yeah, I was is, actually, involved, is involved in something that... I was actually asking whether the U.S. officials would prevent efforts to create accountability, thinking that they might be subject to it. And I don't think it. so. I don't, again, don't. because I get back to, I don't think they think right, that's well, a real threat. Let me ask, Melina, what are all the different accountability options and which ones will require U.S. support versus which ones can go at it alone? First, when it comes to accountability for something like this for Yemen, we know that, for example, the ICC is of no use unless, you know, we, um, I, I think we'll talk about this perhaps later um, um, at the end of the day when we have the ICC panel, but we know that there is now the, the Rohingya case where the ICC might exercise jurisdiction because of the um, uh, fleeing of the refugees into Bangladesh, which is a member state of the ICC here, unless you can sh somehow show a link to another state that's a member state of the ICC. I don't see how the ICC well, could get involved. Where are the Yemenis fleeing? Any any ICC states like Jordan, for example? Uh, I, I mean, Margo, I don't know if you, I'm not aware of a huge presence of Yemeni refugees in Jordan, okay. perhaps right, so a handful, but one. not really, okay. exactly. So um, another option would be um, if there were some kind of a hybrid ad hoc tribunal that was set up, for example, like the special court for Sierra Leone. I'm not sure that there's currently an appetite for that, but you know, you never know. Um, there are these um, um, investigative mechanisms that have been set up for Syria and for Burma, which are not direct accountability options, but which might, you know, someday lead to accountability. So that is something that we might look at. And then finally, there are national prosecutions. And there is some precedent for that with respect to Syria. There is right now a universal jurisdiction case, a universal jurisdiction prosecution of a Syrian national in Germany. So the German courts are actually prosecuting someone who might be guilty of having committed atrocity crimes in Syria under pure universal jurisdiction. So something like that might, you know, happen someday. Okay, and I'm not sure if Christian is still in the room. Christian Van Avasser? Oh, he's just out there. No, that's all right. So we talked earlier about the role that he played in creating the Triple IM, that's the Investigative Commission for Syria. Um, what will it take, if he was here, I would ask him, what would it take to create one for Yemen? Is he going to be out there shopping that proposal around? Well, we know with respect to the um, Syrian um, Triple IM, um, we know that the General Assembly really took the lead on this, and we know that you know this is for the students out there. But you know, to, to to have a resolution in the UN General Assembly, you need a majority vote. So there is no veto power. You know, the U.S. or Russia or China don't get to veto. So that is possible. And the question is just: Is there an appetite? These kinds of mechanisms are expensive, right? So that is always um, the the most difficult part. But you know, I actually am optimistic that something like this could be created for Yemen. And then, Sandy, what do you think is the likelihood that there will be prosecutions in some form for this? Ultimately, I think there certainly will be something. I think people demand accountability over time. I think it's essential for their healing process. And I think history has shown us that even when it's delayed, like Cambodia or the Nazi you know, perpetrators we still round up today and try to deport, um, that there will always be some form of justice. But Milena listed a couple different flavors, and I think we don't know what that flavor will be because I suspect it will need to be tailored, as they all have been, to the unique circumstances of what jurisdiction some courts have and don't. There will probably have to be some local component, and that local component will probably require international assistance. And so however that comes out. Um, but I always say, you know, beyond that in the transitional justice theme, there's a lot of other mechanisms that go along with the prosecutions that will help the people to heal as well. And so those should be part of it. Okay, I want to leave lots of time for the questions from the audience because we have an amazing panel and they're so full of energy and enthusiasm on this topic. So let's open it up. Jennifer. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Terrific panel. So um, Milena um, and Michael talked about mechanisms and we have a third one. It's the funny UNITAD one that's the one-sided one. Let's only investigate ISIL crimes, which I think has some problems. But um, and he talked about a possibility of a Yemen mechanism. And I have such mixed feelings. So I want to ask you what you think about these mechanisms, because you're like, well, they're preserving evidence. Who could be against that? But is there a danger the international community thinks, oh, look, well, we've created something, and it can feed one or two cases in Europe, and that's accountability. So do we have this danger? You know, in the macro level, we used to create tribunals, 
And now we seem to be creating mechanisms. So I can't but worry about this trend a little bit. And just to but add to that, once a mechanism is created, it all becomes secret and you no longer have public diplomacy. And, and that's also a little bit worrisome, right? What do you think, Margo? On that, just to add another danger to that point and specifically talking about UNITAD, what you see when these mechanisms get set up is there are claims and plans for being very embracive of the local civil society documenters that have a lot of evidence, and then you don't necessarily see that borne out as well. So you have this, exactly like you said, this feeling that there's an international process, but what I'm hearing by, with, from the human rights documenters that I work with in Iraq, for example, they don't feel like it's actually a place for them to bring the evidence. Hey, David Crane. Let me uh, let me splash a little bit of optimism uh, in uh, <laughs> what, what, what appears to be uh, uh, a gloom and doom, and certainly uh, it, it has shifted. The age of accountability is now shifted into somewhat the age of the strong man, and we're a little bit rocked back on our heels. But there's incredible, important work across the world, uh, such as Yemeni Accountability Project, the great work that many people in here are doing, uh, to include the PLIPG. But just from an historical context, just pause and think. Just 10 years ago, the most powerful warlord in Africa never thought that he would be held accountable for war crimes and crimes against humanity in West Africa. And now he sits in Her Majesty's maximum security prison for the rest of his life for being held accountable. So I, I can remember when, uh, when we took Charles Taylor down in that fateful summer of 2003, uh, Half the world was mad at me, and the other half of the world was too shocked to say anything. But the point was is that we did do something, and we did take the steps. And so, again, I, I want to just say that we are going to get the bad guys someday. It may take time. It takes a long time sometimes. But don't, don't give up the fight just because it isn't clear where this is all going. We have to face down the beast of impunity wherever it rears its ugly head, or we're going down a very, very dark hole. So uh, just think about Charles Taylor and when he gets up every morning now and thinks the victims of, in West Africa won as opposed to lost. So I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. One of the things Paul is famous for is he's the master of alliteration. He says things like timid and tardy and persistent and patient. And the latter are the words he uses for the international community's approach to international justice. Does anybody want to comment more on that? I think yeah, what you said was very eloquent. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, two, two quick questions uh, regarding the veto. Do you think it's because of internal pressure from the Department of Defense or from the Saudis if you know, the Senate and the uh, House vote to, to cut off the arms, and he vetoes that. It seems like that would have given him political cover to, oh, Congress has voted for this, I'm going to go with it. So is it from pressure from the Saudis, or the Department of Defense doesn't want to appear weak to the world or to Iran or to Saudi Arabia? And the second question regarding accountability, it's, I, as a prosecutor, I know it's important to see justice, and, and, but is it more important to, to see justice and prosecute people or to solve the underlying economic problems, and I'll use Ireland as an example, with the Good Friday Accords where, you know, Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley both ended up in serving in the government and they were responsible for some of the reasons for the troubles. Thanks. So I'll, I'll jump in real quickly on that one because, again, I, I, we don't always know what everybody's motivations are in this process, but the timing is actually pretty good right now for the Congress because, because we're at a point where we probably need to negotiate some sort of a peace settlement and there is a recognition that Saudi Arabia is just not going to win this. It gives a graceful time for a pause in providing weapons to this conflict. I mean, I don't think it's a long-term matter that we're going to back away from our relationship with the Saudi Kingdom. I don't, I don't see it happening long-term. I don't see DOD supporting that, and I don't see anybody in the administration supporting that. But I do think there is time for at least a strategic pause now in immediate weapons <coughs> sales because of the Khashoggi affair, because the timing is right for peace. And so I think that's the way everybody saves a little bit of face. You take a pause, the administration can say we're, we're behind peace temporarily, and then they'll stop the weapons sales for a while, and it will fit part of a plan that I think is convenient on everybody's side. I mean, that, that's what I would hope for in any now, event. Now, for the second part of the question, it was really the opposite. This is a very pro-accountability panel, but the whole world of experts are not 
all in that camp. And I think that the Good Friday Accords is, in fact, one of the um, examples that are often cited by the other camp. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to weigh in on that? Because I know what you guys all think on it. Um, nobody? Okay. Well, I guess we're getting more and more pro-accountability. <laughs> so, um, Next question. Roy Gutman. Question of background. <clears throat> what is the Iranian role in supporting the Houthis today? <clears throat> how, how important are they? What are the Iranian, if, if there's a peace negotiation, the Iranians will be there, if not in person, then <clears throat> by proxy. What are their, uh, what are their aims in, uh, <clears throat> in Yemen? And uh, then uh, connected with that, uh, what have the Houthi done that would constitute war crimes or crimes against humanity? <clears throat> Let me just jump in on Iran. Um, I'll let you answer the rest of it. Um, so with respect to the recent attack on the Saudi oil production facility, yes, the Houthi rebels claim responsibility, but it, it appears that the weapons that they're using, the drones and um, other weapons that they're using, it appears that those come from Iran. So same way, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that some of the Saudi weapons come from the United States. It does appear that some of the weapons that the Houthi rebels have come from Iran. Now what I worry, it seems to me that the current administration is particularly anti-Iran and the I, I could sort of hear the war drumbeat, you know, uh, more and more loudly, uh, you know, and it really reminds me of the post 9-11 era where the same kind of thing happened with respect to Iraq. And so... Do you think that's as true now that John Bolton has left? But I mean, I think there are other people like jo John Bolton and I, I, what I worry about this particular administration is the, you know, where is Waldo and steroids common, that, that the current president doesn't really seem to have a clear policy and that he appears to change his mind, you know, 20 times a day with respect to various things, and that there are people in the administration who are actively undermining some of his choices, right, because they know that's not the right thing to do. So I don't really see a clear plan coming from, from this administration. I'll just yes, uh, answer Roy's initial question with a, with a story. Um, when we were there in um, Sa Yemen and we went up to Sada to engage in the negotiations with the Houthis, an invitation was sent to Jamal Benamar to meet with um, Al Houthi, the head of the Houthi uh, organization, and they said, um, you can bring your bodyguards, but they have to be unarmed. And a number of the bodyguards for, for Jamal Benamar were, were Lebanese. Uh, and then when they went to the, um, to the arranged point, they went from sort of house to house to house. And Jamal afterwards had said, every time we went to an undisclosed location and there was a change of the guard from the Houthi side, there were more Lebanese present. And then we went to another location. And by time it was the meeting with Jamal Benamar and then the head of the Houthis, <laughs> Benamar's unarmed security was his Lebanese detail and the Houthi security or Hezbollah detail. And that's how deeply integrated at that time, back in 2014, that Iranian Hezbollah were integrated in with, um, and they were wearing suits. And he's like, hmm, Houthi's not so keen on suits, but <laughs> Hezbollah had their nice tailored suits. Uh, so it's, it's from the very beginning, there was this collaboration and cooperation uh, at that micro level. And I think it's just continued and deepened since then. Next question. been documented, I mean, you've been working on about um, recruitment of child soldiers, torture, unlawful detention, also destroying hospitals, so some of the sim actually similar crimes that you're seeing from um, the Saudi-wide coalition as well, you can see on the Houthi side. And I, I would just also add to that that they um, have destroyed a number of marketplaces and villages where um, that was the entire access to food supply. So there may be um, an argument there for destruction of objects indispensable to survival or for use of starvation as a means of warfare. Next. Hey, back there. Just a comment in, to your previous question as to whether there's any defenders of, of a non sort of retributive just desert uh, justice. I mean, there's an old argument, not old, I mean, from the 1940s that sort of percolates uh, in political philosophy about genocide 
And the argument is this, that as soon as you treat genocide as a different kind of crime, then you do mass murder. Then you are treating people as groups and you're not treating them as individuals. The original Western Enlightenment view of treating, uh, of, of requiring just desert uh, corrective justice, the Kantian view, uh, requires that each person be treated as a unique individual. That's not true in genocide where somebody as a member of a group gets special treatment or often it's been given worse treatment. As soon as you do that, you move to a Bentham model. When you move to a Bentham model, a consequentialist model, um, and here, Michael, as you know, I've been teaching philosophy here in this law school for 37 years, so I'm, I'm sorry about this. Um, <laughs> as soon as you move to a Bentham model or a consequentialist or utilitarian model, then you look for the greatest good for the greatest number. And if you can save people's lives by allowing some jerk to walk free and live in splendor in Moscow or in Paris or in Buenos Aires, but you're saving people's lives, then Bentham and the consequentialists and a lot of other people uh, are going to say that that is a greater good. And you can justify it. And then you move off. You move, you move to the Good Friday Accords. And you move to uh, Abraham Lincoln after you know, his five minutes celebrating his victory before he was killed. And, and, and you move into that direction. And you move into uh, Nelson Mandela. And you move away from this panel. Well, so I it's could, good yeah. to know that our students are getting a lot of philosophy here at the law yeah, school. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add in a point to that because for those of you in here, I know some of you have been at the State Department before in your careers. I mean, we have that institutional bias built into the State Department. I mean, there is this natural tension that has always come between the regional bureaus and the war crimes office. And... And many times it's not, you know, not this room happens to have everybody fighting for accountability, but there is in almost every case, there's somebody at the table who, while they value accountability, they think the piece comes first in a sequencing way and that you may have to give up some of the accountability. And so every time, even through the Charles Taylor time period, there was a very strong African Bureau press through a lot of the times there and in Sudan where you had to at least look at the situation and try to get peace first and then figure out whether you could do accountability. So I know this is a group that is particularly focused on accountability, but I feel like even in longstanding institutions, there is still that position of how many lives can we save up front still gets brought to the that, forefront. That was the point I was trying to make earlier yeah. as well. Go ahead, Dave. You took down Charles Taylor and forced the freedom of speech process, which ultimately mm -hmm. saw the election of uh, the first female as yep. president uh, in, in, an Af in, the, in Africa. So uh, yeah, I, and that was a calculated move on my part. I knew mm -hmm. where this was going, but I wanted to force the process. And the, mm -hmm. you can't, because I'd already indicted him. It was a sealed indictment. And I, my thinking was, they can't negotiate with an indicted right. war criminal, because as soon as I do reveal it, it'll pull the rug right out of all of those mm -hmm. peace process. So I went up front uh, and did it that way. And at, at the end, even though it was a tough summer, it eventually saw a movement away from uh, where Liberia was going and a, a more peaceful process. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not a cookie-cutter approach. Uh, this worked, but sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Professor Mendez. Well, on that topic precisely, I mean, all conflict, conflicts end in different ways. And sometimes they end with uh, a lot of impunity, um, and sometimes they end with a, a good ration of justice. And there is no cookie cutter um, uh, process here. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there are, uh, but the times in which we said peace trumps anything else, uh, including justice, are long gone. Uh, they're long gone since the Rome Statute, 1998, uh, but also because it, uh, it creates a whole new paradigm. Uh, for the resolution of conflicts, where, whereby at least one has to make the effort to uh, make sure that peace and justice um, feed each other, because uh, a peace without any justice is a formula for new conflict, for new violations, uh, and also because even if it wasn't, if it isn't, for example, Northern Ireland, uh, South Africa, um, 
the victims deserve better from us. They, they deserve better from us and from the international community and from uh, conflict resolution specialists. So uh, it's not a matter of saying, yes, let's put everybody behind bars and then see whether we can get a, con a, a resolution of the conflict or not. But at the very least, uh, we all owe it to ourselves, to the international community, and particularly to the victims of atrocities that if we're going to put an end to a conflict, we at least pay attention to them and see if we can find enough space for justice within a peace process. I think if that's I, a, can, a, go ahead, Paul. I can just echo, echo Juan's comments. I think, I think this is, there's this assumption that peace first saves lives and that the accountability crowd has to make the case for accountability. Um, we have to be very careful about assuming that peace actually saves lives. If you look back during the Yugoslavia conflict, Dick Holbrook and others were famous for saying, well, President Milosevic, he's the arsonist, but he's also the fireman. Turns out Milosevic was the arsonist. And that, those efforts didn't actually lead to peace. It was the use of force and the accountability that brought peace. And so it'd be nice to see that assumption switch and have the peace first crowd, our friends, our former fr our friends, our friends formerly at the State Department, <laughs> some of whom are former friends, uh, <laughs> assumption that right. peace first will save lives, rather than always looking at us and saying, hey, accountability folks, prove it. Well, if this were actually talking foreign policy, I would look at the clock and know that I would have to say something like, our producer is saying that we're almost out of time. I want to thank our panelists. Dr. Paul Williams, Margot Day, Sandy Hodgkinson, Melania Stereo, Jim Johnson, and Dr. Laura Graham. Thank you for joining us for Talking Foreign Policy. All right, our next panel will begin in 15 minutes. It's panel four, the ILC's draft convention on crimes against humanity. We'll see you in 15 minutes.